Assalamu alaikum. One of the major problems with Judaism is sort of their description of God. So there are a lot of blasphemies that are attributed to him, weaknesses, imperfections, etc. So one of the criticisms that can be made about Judaism is Christianity took a man and they turned him into God, and Judaism took God and in many respects they turned him into a man. So we've been discussing many of these aspects uh, on the channel. Uh, so the idea of God resting and refreshing and regretting and crying and wearing Teflon and studying Torah and uh, playing, etc., etc. So th th there are many examples of this. How about Adam resembles God uh, and whatnot. And so there's a Midrash which uh, really goes into this when it tells its story. And so I thought it'd be uh, useful in this video to read the Midrash and see sort of how the ancient rabbis were uh, perceiving God, because clearly the Talmudic rabbis were seeing God, uh, uh, you know, with in a much more human way, uh, etc. And so it'd be interesting to read this Midrash and again get a perspective of how the ancient rabbis were perceiving who God was. So this uh, Midrash is based on the story of the destruction of the Temple, or I should say it's based on the destruction of the Temple. That is what the story is based on. It's based on God's reaction to the destruction of the Temple. So let's read through it and we'll see a lot of problematic things. So the reference is at the top. That is why I say, let me be, I will weep bitterly. Press not to comfort me for the ruin of my poor people, Isaiah 22.4, said Resh Lakish. There were three moments when the angels wanted to see a song in front of the Holy One of Blessing, and he did not permit them, namely in the generation of the flood, and at the Sea of Reeds, and at the destruction of the temple. At the generation of the flood, as it is written, Adonai said, My Lord, or my breath shall not abide in man forever, Genesis 6.3. At the sea, as it is written, the, the one who could not come near the other all through the night, Exodus 14.20. And at the destruction of the temple, as it is written, that is why I say, let me be, I will weep bitterly, press not to comfort me, Isaiah 22.4. So according to this Midrash uh, interpretation, God was weeping bitterly and he was saying, press, do not comfort me. So right, the whole idea here is God was, the angels were trying to sing in front of God to comfort him because he was clearly very sad about the temple being destroyed. And God said, no, don't comfort me, right, as he's weeping. It is not written, do not continue, but do not press. This tells that the Holy One of Blessing said to the angels of service, all these consolations that you are saying in front of me, press me. So the angel is trying to console him and he's saying, don't. Why? For my Lord Elohim of hosts had a day of tumult and din and confusion. So God had a day of confusion and tumult and din. What does tumult and din mean, by the way? Because these are English words you probably never heard of. Din means like loud, confused, and usually inharmonious sounds. Uproar, turmoil, disturbance, commotion, terminal, turbulence, agitation, loud, confusing, loud noises, sounds, noises, tumult, a state of noisy, confused activity noise, sounds, etc. So, uh, this is sort of what tumult and din means. So, God had a, a day of tumult and din and confusion. Very problematic. Why is God confused? Another interpretation of my Lord Elohim of hosts summoned on that day to weeping and lamenting. So, he was weeping and lamenting. What does lamenting mean? It means mourning, right? To express one's deep grief about something. So, he was mourning, he was weeping, etc. At the moment that the Holy One of Blessing decided to destroy the house, he said, While I am still in it, the people of the world cannot touch it. Rather, I will turn my eyes from it and swear that I won't see it until the end of times. And the enemies came and destroyed it. Immediately the Holy One of Blessing swore by his right hand and hid it on his back as it is written, He has hidden his right hand in the presence of the foe. Lamentations 2.3 at that very moment, the enemies entered in the temple and burned it, and once it was burned, the Holy One of Blessing said, Again, there is no dwelling for me on the earthland. I will separate my Shekhinah, which is his presence, from it, and I will go to my original residence, as it is written, and I will return to my abode until they realize their guilt and search for my face. Hosea 5.15 
At that very moment, the Holy One of Blessing was crying and saying, Oh, woe to me! What did I do? I caused my Shekinah to stay below of Israel, and now that they sinned, I return to my original residence. I should become a joke to the peoples and a motif of laughter among humans. By the way, the Shekinah is like the Divine Presence, so Talmudic literature, there are some rabbis who would look at that and say, that is God himself. Others would say, no, that is a creation of God. So there is disagreement. In the Zohar, it is the female aspect of God. But, uh, so just want to declare what, what it means. I was dwelling, my, my Shekinah was dwelling there, etc., etc., okay? But anyway, so notice how here God is crying and he's saying, woe to me, what did I do? I should become a joke to the people, a laughingstock, essentially. At that very moment came Metatron. Metatron is an angel and fell on his face and said in front of him, Master of the universe, I should cry, but you should not cry. He said, If you don't let me cry now, I will enter into the place where you have no permission to enter, and there I will cry, as it is written, For if you will not give heed, my inmost self will weep in the hidden places because of your arrogance. Jeremiah thirteen seventeen. I've already shown in other videos, Talmudic literature, that God actually cries in the Talmud. He cries over the destruction of the temple, and he does say stuff like, Woe to me. The Holy One of Blessing said to the angel of the service, Let's you, let's all you and I go see what the enemy did to my house. Immediately the angels of service, the Holy One of Blessing and Jeremiah arrived in front of it. When the Holy One of Blessing saw the temple, he said, Obviously this is my house in the place of my rest. The enemies came and did as they pleased. At that very moment, the Holy One of Blessing cried and said, Oh, oi, woe to me on account of my house. My children, where are you? My Kohanim, where are you? My beloved ones, where are you? What can I do for you? I warned you, and you did not do Teshuva. The Holy One of Blessing said to Jeremiah, I'm like a person who had an only son and made a chupa for him, and he died under his chupa, and you have no empathy for me or my son. Go call Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Moshe, because they know how to cry. So this is Abraham, uh, Isaac, uh, Jacob, uh, and Moses. Jeremiah said to him, Master of the universe, I don't know where Moses is buried. The Holy One of Blessing said, Go to River Jordan and yell, Son of Amram, Son of Amram, stand up and see your flock swallowed up by the enemies. Immediately Jeremiah went to the cave of Meshpelah and told the ancestors of the world, Raise up because the time of you being wanted by the Holy One of Blessing has arrived. They asked him why, and he answered, I don't know. That was because he was afraid, they would say, it was under your days that this happened to our children. Jeremiah set them, and they went to the banks of the river Jordan and called, Son of Amram. So, what is Son of Amram? That is Moses, because Moses is the son of Amram, okay? Um, son of Amram, raise up, because the time of you being wanted by the Holy One of Blessing has arrived. He said, why is this day any different than any other day that I wanted by the Holy One of Blessing? Jeremiah said, I don't know. He said, he said him. Moshe went to the angels of service whom he knew from the times of the giving of the Torah and asked, High ones of the service, do you know why I am being wanted by the Holy One of Blessing? They said to him, Son of Amram, don't you know that the Beit Hamkadash, which is the temple, was destroyed and the people of Israel exiled? He began, he began screaming and crying until he got to the ancestors of the world, and immediately they too tore their clothes and put their hands on their heads, and began screaming and crying until they got to the gates of the Beit uh, Hamkadash, which is the temple, and as soon as the Holy One of Blessing saw them, immediately, Lord, uh, immediately Lord Elohim of hosts summoned on that day to weeping and lamenting and to let hair go untrimmed and to use of sackcloth. Um, by the way, I think it'll be useful to go to Chigaiga 5b, which mentions God crying in the Talmud as well, because you'll see there's more to this than you might see. Okay, so the Gemara asks, but is there crying before the Holy One? Plus B. So here they say, the verse states, But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret for your pride. So the Rav is saying that the Holy One, blessed be he, has a place where he cries, right? Why does he cry? Because of the pride of the Jewish people. He cries due to the pride of the kingdom of heaven. And there's another uh, place which mentions he cries because of 
because of the temple. Okay, so the Gemara asks, and doesn't God cry in the outer chamber? So he, here they're basically saying God cries in his innermost chambers, not in the outer chambers. Uh, usually he doesn't cry in the outer chambers. So the Gemara asks, doesn't God cry in the outer chambers? Isn't it written? And on that day, the Lord, the God of hosts, called to weeping and to mourning and to boldness and to Girding with sackcloth, the Gemara responds, The destruction of the temple is different, as even the angels of peace cries, cried, as it is written, Behold, their valiant ones cry without. The angels of peace weep bitterly. So, this is Chagaga 5b. In the Talmud, you can see this as well. As we return now to the Midrash. And weren't for the text to be explicitly written, one could not say it, but they were crying and walking from gate to gate as a person whose dead relative is in front of their eyes, and the Holy One of Blessing was speaking like one speaks a eulogy, saying, Oi to the king who was able to he was able in his early days, but was not able in his old age. At that moment Rachel our matriarch jumped forward before the Holy One blessed be he and said, Master of the universe, it is known before you that your servant Yaakov's love for me knew no bounds, and he worked for me and he worked for my father for seven years for me. When those seven years were completed and the time came for my marriage to my husband, my father advised exchanging, exchanging me with my sister. This was exceedingly difficult for me. When I learned of this counsel, I informed Yaakov, Jacob, and I gave him a sign so that he could uh, distinguish between me and my sister so that my father would not be able to exchange me. After that, I consoled myself. I suffered to overcome my desire and had compassion for my sister that she did not suffer disgrace, and I gave her all the signs that I had given to my husband so that he would not think that she was Rachel. I acted kindly with her. I was not jealous of her, and I did not cause her to be shamed and disgraced. What am I, flesh and blood, dust and ashes, that it was not, that I was not jealous and my, and jealous of my rival wife, or my rival wife, that I did, and that I did not allow her to be, uh, shamed and disgraced, but you, merciful, living, and eternal king, why were you jealous of idolatry that is of no import, and exiled my children, who you were slain by the sword, and allowed their enemies to do with them as they pleased? God's mercy was immediately revealed, and he said, For your sake, Rachel, I shall return Israel to their place, for there is a reward for your labor, and there is hope for your future, declares the Lord, your children shall return to their country. To their country. So compare that now to the Quranic description of the event of the temple destructions. وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرُودِ مَرْوَتَيْنِ وَلَا تَعْلُنَّ أُلُوًا كَبِيرًا And we decreed to the children of Israel in the scripture that you will surely cause corruption on the earth twice and you will surely reach a degree of great haughtiness. Okay. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَاهُمَا بَعَسْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ إِبَادًا لَنَا أُولِي بَعْسٍ شَدِيدٍ فَجَاسُوا خِلَالَ الدِّيَارِ so when the time of promise came for the first of them, we sent against you slaves of ours, those of great military might, and they probed even into the homes, and it was a promise fulfilled. Then we gave back to you return victory over them, and we reinforced you with wealth and sons and made you more numerous in manpower. In Ahsantum Ahsantum Lianfusikum وَإِنْ أَسَعْتُمْ فَلَهَا فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ لِيَسُوءُ وُجُوهَكُمْ وَلِيَدْخُلُوا الْمَسْجِدَ كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرْوَةِ وَلِيُتَبِّرُوا مَا عَلَوْ تَتْبِيرًا If you do good, you do good for yourselves, and if you do evil, you do it to them, or yourselves, meaning. Then when the final promise came, we sent your enemies to sadden your faces and to enter the masjid, which is, uh, you'd call it the temple, but it's masjid or mosque in English, 
as they entered it the first time and to destroy what they had taken over with total destruction. It is expected if you repent that your Lord will have mercy upon you, but if you return to sin, we will return to punishment, and we have made hell for the disbelievers a prison bed. So look at that. That's, that is how God speaks, not uh, what the Midrash tells and what the Talmud backs up.